I'm just going to introduce Jamie Heinricher, who is the owner of Sherwood Press and the special project Wind Eye Handmade Paper. She's a lifelong, nearly lifelong resident of Olympia. Um, she's a printer, a teacher, and came to the Sherwood Press as a volunteer, and um, soon it uh, became a lot of her life, but she's like most of the artists and creatives who have presented, has a lot more cool stuff going on, even than just her main practice. So we're gonna hear about it now. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jamie. Well, um, thank you so much, um, Nicole, for um, inviting me to do this. And um, I've, I know you invited me a long time ago and I haven't actually really prepared as much as I would like. And, um, I feel always like very prepared to talk about the press and Sherwood and um, I you could say I have a shtick around that because I've had so many like public events that um, I just know how to tell the story about the press and um, but I kind of wanted to do something a little different this time I do want to talk about the press and the history just a bit but since we have a little bit longer um, time today I also kind of want to go through uh, some of my own personal stuff, which isn't stuff I usually talk about. And partly because um, I don't really consider myself an artist. And so um, I guess I consider myself a creative in the broad sense of the term. But um, when it comes to being featured as an artist, um, I'm, you know, I'm a commercial letterpress shop and I do design, but it, it ends up making me feel like um, it doesn't make sense for me to talk about my work. So I'm trying to break out a little bit today and show you some of kind of my pet projects over the years. Um, they're not all, they're not all things I'm particularly proud of in terms of design. So I just wanted to say that I have like a long design career and um, I'm not going to be showing you what I think of as the best of my design work but more like the things that have, have been fun or a little extracurricular, um, things that are just have, have been, kept me going over many years of like not making any money and <laughs> being pretty solitary up here at the press. So um, I did um, some, a few years ago, Jenny, I can't remember when you had me up to, um, SVC and I did a 10 minute little overview of the press and I still have that photo set. So um, just as a quick overview, I think most of you probably know the story of the press pretty well, but um, Jocelyn Dome is the um, woman who founded the press in 1940. She grew up right um, below this building and um, she went to Ole High and um, she went to UW. And while she was at UW, she um, decided to start a printing press when she graduated. So in the summer of 1940, her dad basically being this really progressive and indulgent dad um, built her this shop that I'm sitting in right now. So I'm sitting in the window that you can see behind this tree here. Um, it, so that was in the summer 1940. She had a partner at the time and they bought some old equipment from a, a press called the Metropolitan Press in Seattle and they opened up and um, they operated for about a year and a half before her partner Betty um, got married and left the business. And Jocelyn basically in this in this building had a 63 year career as a letterpress printer using a very pretty fixed, I'd say kind of a fixed state kind of setup. She did swap out a few presses over the years and um, she bought type, but um, the presses never, before I came around, it really never occupied anything but this particular footprint. So it's pretty remarkable, um, especially as you discover what's happened since I took over. Um, it's a remarkable to me that she could have a 63 year career in such a tiny space. It's like, I think 420 square feet. 
Um, but it's a beautiful space and I can see why she didn't want it to um, change anything about it. Um, this is the, a picture of the press when it was brand new, um, the assessor photo. You can see that there's no steps and there was no, um, there wasn't even a driveway. You had to walk through the woods to get up to the press and her first presses had to be dragged through the woods on skids just to get them up to the building. Um, let's see here, let's searching for number three. This is an early picture of Jocelyn. I sure wish you could see this better. Maybe I'll just try to open these. Um, this is probably a picture she took very early on for press purposes because she and her partner got some good press early on for being um, women printers. And at the time that was considered very unusual. So um, she was striking out as a, as a woman in a, in a trade that was really dominated by men at the time. Um, this is Jocelyn and her partner Betty. You can see that they were taking it very seriously. They had their professional business attire on and this was a professionally taken photograph. And um, yeah, I just love that so much. There's their opening announcement. And this typeface actually is called Greta. And I just hate this typeface so much, but this was Jocelyn's absolute favorite typeface for her whole career. <laughs> and I think she considered it for many years like the house. It was her brand typeface. And oh, I hate it so much. I was so happy when I got to stop using that typeface. Does that sound horrible? <laughs> This is Jocelyn. This is pretty late in her life. That's her in the last three or four years of her life. She was uh, such a wonderful person. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why I stuck around for so long is I met her in, I met her in 1989. I was invited by some friends to come tour this place because I had done some calligraphy for them and they were having a, their wedding announcement printed here and uh, they thought I would like it. So I made a appointment to come up here. And just from the first moments that I met Jocelyn, I just, I found in her just such a wonderful companion and friend. She was incredibly smart and open-minded. She was graceful and incredibly kind. She was a very humanitarian person. She helped people all the time. Like there was a church in town that they, the friends meeting and they didn't have a phone and she actually let them use her phone. And so everyone who wanted to call friends meeting would call Jocelyn and she, um, she would answer and sometimes it would be people who needed money or help with rent or something. And instead of passing it on to the friends meeting, she would just do it herself. And we would sometimes jump in her van and drive off to like a exit off the freeway and meet someone and she would give them money. She was just an incredibly uh, um, virtuous and cool person. And I just probably, in a lot of ways, I was more attracted to her than I was to the practice of printing. That was kind of like a bonus part. It was fun. I could, I adapted to it quickly and I had already been into book binding and, and um, calligraphy. So it kind of was natural, but it was really Jocelyn that um, brought me here and kept me here for so long. She was fantastic. It's not the best, but this is what the press kind of looked like when I came here. Can you see that? Thumbs up. I mean, it's not big, but yes. Um, every press had stacks of stuff in front of it, on the side of it. Every little workspace was crammed full of, of stuff. And a lot of it was super old. It was crap. It was outdated. So when I first showed up, um, 
I saw a role for myself just in kind of helping her declutter, but it took years to do that because she didn't want to get rid of anything. She was, she was borderline hoarder. But um, if you wanted to use a press, you had to move boxes just to get physically close enough to a press to, to use it. So that was kind of a, how things were when I first showed up. And it took years just to get this place kind of, kind of cleared up. Um, this is a picture of Jocelyn and I, um, I think in the year 2000, um, a friend of mine came and took some nice pictures of us. Um, here is a, hope you can see that. This is a very early picture of me on the windmill. So this is this printing press I'm printing on is uh, the Heidelberg windmill. Um, we have four of them now and it's kind of become one of my lifelong passions is printing on the windmill, learning how to use it and tune it up and keep it functioning. And so we have some really nice, uh, these machines, they're very versatile. They're really beautiful. Um, one of the challenges, and, and um, I'll probably talk about it just a little bit more later, but um, the building was also, let's see, I came here and she was just getting ready to have her 50th anniversary. And so, in fact, I came here in September and I think she had her she had her um, celebration like the next month for her 50th anniversary. And so the building was already pretty old when I showed up and over the, the years, it was just really starting to struggle. You can see that the big window that's behind me over here, that whole thing was rotting and every time it rained, the water just trickled down on the inside and pooled. And right here, you could stick your finger through the wood to the outside it was it was that rotten and of course it's a huge window so restoring that and getting the press the foundation kind of restored was um, what I um, took on five years ago when we were 75 we had a big restoration campaign we raised quite a bit of money to do some work to get the press kind of ready for its next 25 years so there's a little bit more to do, but we're mostly there. This, um, can you see this? This is a huge tree that used to grow outside the press and you can see it was about maybe three quarters of an inch away from the, the roof. And during windstorms, it would tap the roof. <laughs> so we had to have that out as part of our, um, our last, or that 75 year restoration campaign. Um, where's number 12? So we actually, this is a screenshot of um, my Indiegogo campaign. It was incredibly successful. We had lots of perks. That's, that was one kind of cool thing is that we could make all of our own perks. And we also had a few um, artists who contribute, contributed some other things. So we, we got, we made a lot of stuff to try to raise this money. So this is how much we raised after a month, $16,000. So that was pretty incredible. I think we got up to like 19. And this is a garland that still hangs in here. You can't see it, it's hanging up in here. Everybody who contributed got their name written on a copper tag. So when they visit, they often look for their um, name on the garland. Um, just there was such a community support for this place and it was really heartwarming and um, I wanted to find a way to acknowledge people. Here's some foundation work we did. Um, I want to mention my husband Terry. This is Terry. I hope you can see him. Um, he is, uh, he came into my life uh, 10 plus years ago, and Terry's um, the reason for so much of what's happened in the last 10 years. He's a very skilled man, and he's also just incredibly helpful. He's willing to help me with all of the infrastructure um, upgrades we've made, 
he just steps up in like a thousand million ways to just kind of help my dreams come true. And it sounds kind of um, trite, but um, to have someone who digs in and helps and uses his skills, um, it's just been hugely transformative. So he's kind of behind so, so much of what, uh, what's happened here to improve the place um, in the last 10 years. Here's a, my friend Devin, who actually rebuilt this window using all the original glass, which was um, sort of a something I wanted. Here's the, we called that tree the nutcracker. I called it the nutcracker because I thought it was gonna crush the press someday. <laughs> and that's it coming out. There's Terry actually trying to disengage the stump from the ground. That was a huge project. And there it is actually on the ground on its side after he, we were going to remove it and, and put it somewhere else, but it looks so cool where it is that we just left it right there. Um, let's see. Oh, also in, this is, this, this is kind of for later. I actually have another print shop in my garage at home. I have two garages at home. And where I do 90% of my actual production commercial printing is in my garage at home. And so that's where we have three windmills and we just got a KS, which is an incredible press. Um, these are all gonna seem a little bit um, disconnected because it was, it was kind of the whole picture, but this is also, this is a Hollander beater. Um, we started making handmade paper about, I want to say five, five years ago. And in 2016, we actually found an, a Hollander beater um, to purchase and I restored it. It was in just terrible condition having been left outside for many years. And so we grabbed it and um, I spent huge amounts of time trying to restore it. There's the new uh, repainted pedestal on top. And then I repainted and restored the machine and there it is sitting pretty on its new um, table. And that, that studio is actually in my front garage at my house. So we have the, it's called Wind Eye Handmade Paper. And it's called Wind Eye because Wind Eye is like the, the Norwegian word for window is Vindauga. And it, so we translate, and it means Wind Eye, which I thought was a good connection with this big window. And we were doing this at the same time and we were gonna make hand paper, try to sell the paper to raise funds to restore the window. <laughs> If that makes sense. <laughs> the way my mind works is kind of complicated sometimes. But anyway, we didn't end up actually using that to make money for the window, but there was a connection there. So that's why um, we call it Wind Eye Handmade Paper. And um, we still um, make paper. I don't nearly spend as much time in the paper studio as I'd like to. But um, Devin DeMonte, who's a, he's an intern, um, he actually spends quite a bit of time making paper. And um, we are kind of in the process of trying to figure out the future of the paper making studio. Um, he would like to teach and COVID-19 happened and that's made it kind of hard, but here's kind of a picture, a partial picture of the paper studio with the Hollander beater in the middle and the drying box and the hydraulic press. It actually looks pretty different now, but um, on a to take a big leap, here's Jocelyn on the left, um, probably back, it looks like early 60s to me, wearing plaid pants. And here's um, an intern that I had named Marissa wearing plaid pants. <laughs> And um, this was here just to acknowledge like the numerous um, young people who've come through the press over the years to often do um, credit work for Evergreen, um, sometimes just to be around and help out. And I've had some 
really wonderful relationships with mostly young women, to be honest. Um, and it's been like incredibly enriching kind of the, the sort of constant cycling of like really cool, talented, helpful young women who've come through the press. Marissa is, um, she's incredibly dear to me. I miss her like crazy. She's in New York and um, she's an incredible young lady. So here's what the press looks like today. Um, this building on the right, I didn't mention it, but um, I had this building built in 2008. It was actually finished in 2008 and it was meant to be sort of the beginning of expanding usable space for the press and um, we used it for a while for years um, as um, bindery space and now it's a rented studio for another artist that helps kind of offset the costs um, it's really expensive to have a house and a, a a physical location for your business that doesn't make very much money and my my house is like three blocks away so i have all the exact same bills in both places i have water sewer garbage here i have water sewer garbage up there dsl in both places and property taxes in both places and it's really expensive so we decided to rent out that building it helps um just ease the load a little bit although we really miss having this the space and there's our there's the nutcracker stump. I think it looks like a heart or kind of like a molar and I just love it. It's sort of, it's sprouting mushrooms now and it's on its way to becoming part of, part of the land again. So that's, that was the little SBC quick visual tour of the press. Um, it doesn't really have, it's not a complete, um, picture of the facility obviously but um if you ever want to come up here i'm going to stop my screen sharing for a second here if you ever are here i know most of you have been here probably some of you haven't but um there's there's another studio on the property that we're going to be um sort of upgrading which is our type collection it's called the black hawk shed and um back in 2000 a man who's a film preservationist gave us a, um, a an entire base print shop um, it, with seven cabinets of type mostly like um, silent film type and um, a printing press which is right here to my right Can you see it? <laughs> i can't really turn my computer well enough but it's an old chandler and price treadle press um, and we incorporated all that here, but we didn't have room for the type in here. So we built a building and the type is a whole other scenario. It's, we have like 14 cabinets of type, but it's not in great use here because we're doing commercial letterpress. We're mostly using plates and we're using photopolymer. So we're basically taking we're taking um, digitally designed work and we're creating printing plates in-house on a plate maker and um, then we're using those on the old presses and this is i think a lot of commercial letterpress now is is um, using this technology it's really made it um it's it's maybe not like traditionally letterpress it's not handset type but it it does put um, a living within reach for a lot of um, letterpress printers and um, it is it makes it really possible to work with clients because when I first took over um, all the work was hand set and so I set a wedding for instance and someone would come back to look at a proof and they would say well, can we just move that over and make that a little smaller and maybe, you know, put this over here and or change the typeface. And of course, that all entailed hours of, you know, breaking the whole thing down, putting everything away and starting over. 
and it just became untenable. It was really hard to uh, charge enough to make that work. So we're really kind of a hybrid shop now. So I think I mentioned this earlier, but I'll, I'll give you a sense of kind of what the scope of work is that we do here. And right now it's just me. I do have an employee who is laid off and she's a press operator for me and a kind of a production assistant, but she is laid off right now. Um, so throughout the history of the press, it's always been a commercial run of the hook press print shop. So that means that we're just waiting around for clients to show up with their mostly business printing or social, social stationery. So, um, we traditionally didn't really initiate anything and maybe occasionally Jocelyn would make like she would print her own um, Christmas cards for instance or maybe just make something fun once in a while if it was slow but for the for the most part I mean and I mean the gargantuan most part of Jocelyn's career everything she printed was client work um, when I came along you know, for 14 years, I was a volunteer, so I wasn't really doing the client work. So I did a bunch of fun projects early on. Um, and ever since I took over, <laughs> it's just been, it's been hard to find the time to do very much that isn't really just commercial letterpress for hire. So um, sometimes it's busy and I can't do anything. And every once in a while, there's something, uh, there's some time to do things. So, you know, er I'll give you an example of, um, um, I did this as a, to help me remember to lubricate my machines. Um, that was just a whim you know there's every once in a while like this one i made for my dad because he's a morning person and he's always getting on my case for not being a morning person um you know so just occasional broadsides or you know i did this is actually something i got to do at a class at svc which was really fun is to actually do linoleum cuts and um, we do use linoleum here on occasionally if it fits the project. Um, I didn't bring a lot of samples of, of my, actually don't have any any samples of my metal stuff. I have a whole thing of like business cards hanging right there <laughs> but I can't point you to it so um, trust me there's a whole bunch of business cards and other um, client work um, hanging around here. Um, so most of the work we do is, um, again, it's client work. And I didn't want to show a lot of client work because um, that's kind of the obvious thing. And I don't, I feel weird about showing um, people client work when it's, they paid for it and I'm not, I don't have their permission to show it. Um, I do have a portfolio, but I don't show it a lot because I feel fuzzy about um, showing it publicly. So if you're ever here, you can see all the, all the thousands of client jobs that we've done here. But what I wanted to kind of shift focus to is some of the sort of extracurricular things that we've managed to do over the years. And um, because it's not, this business has not always been busy. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's busy now and maybe not right now, but it's been really busy the last few years. Um, but over the years, it's been, sometimes it's busy and sometimes it isn't. So I wanted to just show you some of the things that um, I've been able to work on when it isn't very busy. And I think I'll start with something called the Olympia Propaganda Squad. So um, back in 2004, 
um, that's when Bush and Kerry were um, opposed in the election. Um, I put together a group of people and we called ourselves the Olympia Propaganda Squad. And I, it, looking back, it's kind of funny that we called it that because it would, probably should have been called Counter Propaganda Squad. Um, what we did is we made tons and tons of these, um, this right here is called a pocket penny. We made um, buttons. You can see there's one of our pocket pennies with, we had a ton of buttons. Actually, here's like some of our, can you, well, you can't, yeah, I guess you can see in this, in the window of where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> we had tons of different buttons and we went around to events and we um, took donations for all this stuff that we were making. And the object of this was to, we created this poster design and we wanted to have it printed by um, a famous letterpress in Nashville called Hatch Show Print. You, you've probably all heard of it, or maybe you have. It's, it's, a, it's been there for like 125 years. It's, I think in the early days it was, um, they did um, boxing matches and circuses and all the kind of big like tent revivals and stuff they did letterpress posters for stuff like that and we sent them this proposal for a poster and then what they did is they set it in metal and wood type and then they printed 2,000 of these for us and so they printed them in Nashville they shipped them all back here and then for the next um, couple months we called all these organizations all over Florida and asked them if they would be willing to receive free posters as long as they hung them up around Florida. And so um, we managed to get 2,000 posters hung up all over Florida, kind of hoping or wondering if uh, Florida would be another spot where um, um, the vote would be stolen basically. So what we wanted to do is kind of highlight the African-American right to vote and point out the year 2000 as a, as a dark year in that history and um, trying to point toward um, reclaiming um, the democratic process in 2004. So that was kind of a, I mean, this was a completely extracurricular thing. There was no money in it for the press at all. I paid tons of money for just the materials for making all the buttons and all the, the fabric. And we, we made 2000 um, pennies. And it was just like, it was like a little fact, it was like a little political factory. We showed up at a, a lot of political events and we baked little pies and, it was actually really one of the more fun things that I've ever done. And I kind of want to re, uh, kind of revive that for this election. So if you know of anyone who's interested in volunteering some time to make some political stuff before the election, please send them my way. Um, after the propaganda squad, that was in 2004, the next kind of big thing that I participated in is something called Mid-Century Modern Olympia. And um, I didn't really include as much material here as I hoped, but um, does anybody remember that event? Yeah, a couple people. So I love mid-century architecture. That's one of my um, sideline passions. And I had a list of buildings that I was interested in featuring and so I got to I got this group of people together and um, it was it was amazing how all these people into mid-century just suddenly assembled into this group and we created this mammoth event so my part of it was mostly kind of convening the group and um, kind of scoping the whole thing and also coming up with this broadside which we printed that has um i think i have the a little thumbnail here it's 
it has um, elevation drawings of 12 um, mid-century buildings in Olympia with blurbs about those buildings by the state architectural historian. And the photographs were taken by a man named Larry Mishkar. And then a friend of mine, Katie Cox, she was the architect who drew the drawings. I did all the graphic design and printing and Michael Hauser, the architectural historian, did all the research. And so this was just one little tiny part of this event. Um, I, you probably can't see that too well. This is the event poster and we had, we had home tours. We had a walking tour of downtown. There was a brochure of um, the downtown walking tour. We had films. We had a furniture display. We had classic cars. We had like a, a, a martini bar. <laughs> Um, we had lectures and discussions, and it was just this huge thing. It was happened at um, Washington Center, and we it was really well attended. So that was one of the um, probably the first really big um, event I tried to help organize, and it was really fun. Um, it kind of gave me a taste for taking my design um, mind and my interest in, in design matters and trying to take it to a more public level. So that was mid-century modern Olympia. Then a couple years later, we actually did um, an, a kind of a follow-on event called Plywood. And Plywood was maybe, it was a little bit smaller, but it was a, um, Michael Hauser and I got back together and we created this enormous um, display of the history of the plywood industry in Olympia in the Pacific Northwest and it had all these great images. It was built on this huge plywood like wall and um, so we had that. We had a, a design contest called 4x8 which people um, submitted um, constructions made out of one four by eight sheet of plywood. And then we had a something called a, a one by two cardboard design competition. So you could take corrugated cardboard, one foot by two foot and basically do the same thing and work it in um, a less um, expensive and hard to manage material. So we had a bunch of people submit really cool work and um, trying to remember if there was really much more than that. But that was also at the Washington Center and we had a great turnout for that. So that was, we actually had another one in mind. We were gonna do a celebration of the Halpern Water Garden up on the Capitol campus, but we didn't really get it together. But every time I run into these folks, we always talk about maybe reconvening this group and doing something like this again. Here's the um, the old Olympia Modernism brochure that I put together for the walking tour, and this was like a colossal amount of graphic design work for this whole this whole thing. There was signage and so much stuff. I I put hundreds and hundreds of hours into that project, but it was really awesome. Um, let's see here. So I went through, I went through a whole phase of just doing a bunch of pro bono design work for food summits and stuff like this. And, um, and it's called Come to the Table Food Summit. For some reason, as soon as I started doing pro bono work, I got hit up a ton for this one didn't come through, but a ton of um, food related, like graphic design. These are just a couple um, images, but these were things where there's like multiple pieces and I kind of, I guess I paid my dues for a while just by doing a, a shitload of free, free work around Olympia. And then maybe this is actually before, and I, I hope I don't have it in, um, the wrong order, but I was um, one of the organizers for another project that we 
had an Olympia called Beyond Hiroshima. I don't know if anyone has been around long enough to remember Beyond Hiroshima. It was a it was conceived initially by T.J. Johnson, who used to be one of the um, city council members here. And um, it was an effort to raise awareness about um, the threats of nuclear proliferation. And um, we were also sort of aiming to become a nuclear free zone, which we actually did achieve. Um, this project, um, here's, here's the, here's the like event poster and there was so much to this event it was an entire week it there were films lectures um we had this kind of cool thing called a living room where we we took over an empty space downtown and we just had displays and people could come and go all day and learn about nuclear issues and um so I did all the work for this and um, lots of the organizing. And there was, again, kind of an opportunity to, to kind of create a public awareness campaign around something that I'm pretty passionate about. And um, we did, it did culminate in us getting a, um, uh, what, was it, what is it called? when the city count, a resolution or whatever to um, make Olympia nuclear free zone. But just a couple years later, a new council just wiped it out and, and took it away. But um, we were really uh, proud of all the work we did. It was, it was enormous. Um, I already told you about the restore, revive, rejoice. Um, so I won't, I won't show you more about that. And the, the handmade paper, Trust me, there's just a ton of it here. We haven't really found a way to get it out and to sell it, um, but we have a lot of beautiful handmade paper here. If you're ever interested in some, <laughs> come and just take some away because it's like we're making it and we really don't have a, um, a good way of getting rid of it. Um, let me see, I did all the work for Pie Fest for years, like I think 10 years I did all the, the posters for Pie Fest, which was kind of fun because we had kind of a whimsical look to the whole thing. And um, I tried to get them to let me make these buttons, but they wouldn't let me make these buttons. Let's see here. So product line is, I think I mentioned this before, um, over the years I've tried to, kind of pivot at times to having um, something of a product line here. And we do have one. It's just not something we really push. So we have um, sort of a lot of different notebooks that we make and posters. Um, whenever there's like holiday sales, we always um, haul this stuff out in totes and try to sell some of it because we're not really focused on it. Um, but it's kind of fun to have sort of a, to make stuff because we have all the tools for making so much stuff. Um, let's see. So I'll, I will, um, I'll talk about maybe a couple more things. So one of them is um, another big event that I worked on and helped create was something called Olympia Design Month. And that was last May. And I got together with Janae Huber. She lives here and is um, married to Oliver Stormshack, who owns Olympic Coffee, and that's my big client. Um, and she's really interested in housing and urban design, and I'm interested in architecture. And so we conceived of um, a series of events that took place over an entire month. And so we had films, we had a few, I think three panel um, panels and um, some workshops and tours. And so it was a, a sort of another project on the scale of like mid-century modern Olympia. It was an enormous amount of work. It wiped out my whole spring from, actually from like October through May last year. It took 
a huge amount of my bandwidth, but it was really great. The whole downtown, um, I made posters for a hundred buildings downtown, um, not letterpress, but I put together um, posters for a hundred buildings on the, the history of those buildings and the architecture and they were hanging up all over downtown. So like downtown became like a virtual gallery of architecture. And that was really awesome. We had some great, um, I, I actually put together a panel discussion on development issues. And um, that was really helpful because people are really, really down about developers. And there's a lot of misconceptions about what developers do and why and we had a really cool um, talk about that. So this is another thing I'm kind of proud of even though it's not specifically letterpress related it's just kind of represents to me sort of a maybe a, another level of um, being able to take my skills and my interests and sort of like do something that's community oriented. Um, it's been really really fun for me. Uh, there was our poster and this was the logo I put together for the whole event. And then there was also, um, I just had this little screenshot after the election of Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I was pretty upset. And so I put together a couple events where people just came together and we broke out into different groups and we basically talked about what were actions that we could take to try to um, you know work toward a, pro a progressive agenda here and so um, the first one was kind of like a big community conversation downtown in a space um, at the olympia center and then the next one was more organized into topical um, things so that people could sort of connect with the kinds of of work or groups that they wanted to plug into that were doing positive work there was so much um disenchantment after that election that it was a way to kind of take that and try to channel it into something um positive so that was another thing that um a way to channel again some some work towards something better. Um, I'm not sure if there's I want, there's probably not that much more that I have. Um, this is I know it's kind of jumping around. I have been teaching um, off and on. I taught through Arbutus a few times, um, both paper making and letterpress. I've also been teaching people to, this is actually a woman from Indonesia who came to study with me on printing on the windmill press. Um, so I teach people how to use Heidelberg, Heidelbergs and I also can teach kind of the spectrum of um, basic letterpress technique. Here's some great posters from one of the classes that we had. And <laughs> Um, there's me teaching another guy how to use um, a windmill and um, here's a, another woman <laughs> learning so just a few pictures of people who've come here to learn the basics and um, I I'm kind of um, in in the teaching sense I'm I'm kind of interested in students who really want to learn how to do tight work and i know that there's other ways of learning this and very free form and and um i'm not really the teacher for that type of work so when people want to learn how to do tight printing then i feel like i'm someone who's interested in in teaching this is my um part of my studio at in my garage um, there's my new press right there. It's a Heidelberg KS that came out of Yoshiko Yamamoto's shop in Tacoma. And um, there was another view of our three windmills. There's Terry. And it's a really great space to work in and it it's, cranks out a lot.
here's a picture of one of the presses we bought that was filled with um, die cut slots and dots that poured out of the pedestal when we opened it up. There's Terry with one of the presses when we acquired it. He knows how to move a press, that guy. And I made this because I, I thought it was funny. So easy, even boys can do it. Um, you know, that's probably as much of, of this material as um, I need to show. It's, it's like a real drop in the bucket compared to all the, it's hard to sort through 30 years of work, but this to me is kind of the, these are some of the fun things that I've gotten to work on here in Olympia in my hometown. Um, Amy, do you have time for a couple questions? Of course. It was great to see all those projects. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Jamie? I think there were a couple things in the chat. Oh, earlier Ash said, I love that you decided to leave the stump. It adds additional charm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Jamie, I have a question about your paper making. Yes. Um, have you um, done any paper making on commission yet for other printers or are you still kind of just doing it for yourself and well it's kind of I've had like maybe three commissions now to make paper I'm actually still working on one um, for Nikki McClure we're gonna do a um, a print of one of her pieces with a poem um, on handmade paper you know, I was really reticent for the first few years because it's paper making is it's a delicate science and it's not easy to make a really reproducible piece of paper and a, a great piece of paper. So I'm, I've been kind of reticent to like say, yes, I can make a paper of this thickness and this quality in this quantity because that's kind of a tall order. Mm -hmm. But um, I have done it a few times. It's a yeah. lot of work. <laughs> yeah, every time I have like a very special project come up, I always try to sell. Um, we should have Sherwood Press. Oh yeah, custom <laughs> paper for this. And so far, um, I haven't sold it. But uh -huh. they're always in my thoughts, and I just know it's a matter of time before we can do something like that. Yeah. Well, what I should do is because again, I have drawers full of paper. Mm -hmm. I should just bring some up and just give it to you and if people want to use it they can use it and then you know maybe I, someday. Well I still haven't toured so I need to come down. Okay. <laughs> do a trip. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So Jamie in the comments Celeste said I'm sorry I came in late perhaps I missed this info. How do you take on students? Is there a, po a process and what about during yeah. the pandemic? Well, right now I don't have um, anyone coming in. I, over the years, I've had lots and lots of interns. They've usually come through Evergreen. And they usually come, of course, with a, a goal. So they're not really working for me as much as they're sort of doing a little bit for the press while trying to pull off some projects here. It got to be kind of difficult to, um, have those people because we got so busy I really couldn't like attend to their academic needs or their um, learning needs um, but and I I do have someone who's going to be starting as a volunteer and we're going to practice social distancing for right now that's probably all I'm going to do I always get inquiries and um I'm kind of looking for people who are really serious. Um, it, people come and as soon as they find out how hard it is to lock something up for the platen press, they're like out of there. <laughs> so it's, it's just hard to find people who are skilled who want to stick around. But if someone's serious, they should get in touch with me. Hi, Chris, you're up on the screen. Did you have a, <laughs> yeah. Did you have a question? 
Um, Jamie, you mentioned when you first walked into the studio and you met Jocelyn that you were kind of more interested in her in some ways than, than the press itself. And I'm wondering, after 30 years now, what your feelings are about the, the press and printing and, and you know, everything that you do there. Have your feelings changed in any way? Oh, well, yes. Um, I think early on when I, when I decided to offer myself as a um, successor to Jocelyn, I was pretty young and um, it was scary to me, to be frank. I mean, it was, felt like a lot of responsibility. It wasn't sure I'd be able to pull it off. The press didn't make any money. And I think there was some reticence there so, to commit myself. It felt like taking orders. It felt like going into a convent or something like I was going to be this poor person. And, um, it worked out better than I expected, but um, I think what's really fascinating about anything that you do for 30 years is that you kind of grow into it. And um, I found lots of ways to make this interesting for me. And maybe the, the part of the story, the big story that I haven't said today is that I have really, really grown to love the technology and the um, the craft of actually putting ink on paper. As a designer, I'm I'm less and less interested in in being a designer as I go ahead in my life. I don't think I'm a great designer to begin with, and um, I have real profound limitations. And I've always just tried to work within those, <laughs> just like here's what I can do and here's what I shouldn't try to do. Um, but I almost like want to just become a straight up printer now just for other people's work because I really enjoy the technology of assembling the, the paper and cutting it and getting the plates made and just going through the rigorous steps to get a beautiful print. And I think I could do that now I could do that every day for the rest of my life. That part is really stimulating to me. And using the, the presses, which are so beautiful to me. I just love to be around them. I like to take care of them. I like to acquire, <laughs> acquire them. The presses are really fantastic. Okay. Comments, Celeste says, and the smell of the print room, LOL. And Diana asked, is the handmade paper suitable for intaglio printing? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. But um, if anyone ever wants to try it, um, you're welcome to come and grab some pieces and try it. Most of the um, paper I make is con would be considered water leaf, which means it's not sized. Um, if there's sizing in it, it's residual from some of the, um, the paper that, the recycled paper that goes into it. Because I started making paper specifically to use the cotton scraps from all this expensive cotton paper that goes through the press. So um, there's sizing, residual sizing, but I also can size the paper. So if it's a matter of, um, I'm not sure what intaglio what attributes I would expect it needs to be somewhat soft and but those those um, printmaking papers are so refined and they've been like <laughs> they've been made for so long it's really hard to make paper that um, comes anywhere close to that but if anyone wants to come and grab some sheets I swear to god there's there's st there's stacks like this of handmade paper <laughs> in drawers and lying around. Come and come and get it. I've got a question, Jamie, if, yeah. if we have a moment, uh, which is it's always inspirational to hear you, you talk about the press, but also just to see your work and the breadth of it. Um, I'm wondering if there's like a pro project that you've always wanted to take on that you haven't been able to do, like something that really is kind of like your dream you know, hobby, project, something yeah, else? Yeah, that's a really good question. I have, I have one that is not related to printing, but it, it kind of, it could be a book, but I have one that is really interesting. 
um, that I can't stop thinking about. And Nicole would probably be interested in this. And maybe I told you about it because when I found out you were, you were good at this stuff, I thought maybe I, I probably said it, but I've always had this dream of doing this, like a informal kind of study of people and their money. And so, um, and it would be like, say, take a hundred households and study the money, how they get it, how they spend it, how they store it, how much goes out, like, or w w what they do with an inheritance or whether any of their money is from inheritances. And basically like compare, and so the front of this book, or maybe it's a website, would be kind of um, personal. Could be like interviews or um, photographs of kind of a personal narrative. And then the back of the book would have charts, comparative charts, that help give you an insight into basically income inequality and what that looks like in this really granular way. because. I find that people are really tight-lipped about money and we're living in an economy. We're born into it. We spend our entire lives inside the system that we didn't create. We're disempowered. Some of us are empowered because our parents teach us or we get an education about it, but um, most people are pretty disempowered and so I feel like the people are quiet about it because it sort of perpetuates the disempowerment. And I feel like if people could actually see comparatively how much money goes to food, how much money goes to rent, whether people have debt, what kind of debt do they have, it would be so illuminating and it would create a discussion that is like, it's massively like, um, lacking in our culture like massively lacking not just like the numbers it's like 90 the top one percent has 60s whatever percent of the wealth that's those are easy to, but i mean talking like the household money spectrum that is the if if i had i i've thought about going back to school in economics because i've kind of made a a lifelong study of economics and um, if I could just take on a big, huge project, that would be it. I even just wish someone else would do it. You know, just someone else needs to make this book. Will one of you make it? <laughs> I would help. Um, lots of comments and reply. Um, let's see. Uh, to your offer of paper, Jenny said that's incredibly jealous, but then to get back to the money book, Celeste said, I've been following hashtag publishing paid me recently on Twitter. Very interesting in terms of breaking that silence surrounding money and publishing. Ash said, I agree with your thoughts on money, Jamie, exclamation point, trying to foster these discussion of, discussions among my friends and family. And Stefan says, I love your money book idea. <laughs> And I love it too. I, the other day I saw a meme that was like, um, oh God, it was just one of those like really basic like formulas, like uh, save 20% and you'll be a millionaire when you retire. And it was like, yes, but more than half of the US population doesn't make enough money to make it possible to save 20% and live in a house or live in a shelter. So that doesn't really work. Right. Yeah. I just feel like, like economics is the dominant thing that we're all dealing with every day. And we don't talk about it. And it seems in incredibly insane to me. And plus, you don't, people don't get taught about it in school, which is insane. I can't even understand in a, it makes no sense to me that basic economics and finance isn't start, they don't start teaching it in grade school. And I'm saying this as someone who's had a big struggle my whole adult life to start like getting more empowered and just to focus on it because I hate it. 
I hate all that stuff. And it's taken me a long time to just reconcile myself to like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to pay attention. And um, yeah, I could be in a different place now if I had been more thoughtful as a young person or less terrified. I mean, I've always been terrified of money and debt and all this stuff. And it's, uh, those are long, t like, those have long-term huge impacts. I know this is so off the topic, but this is kind of like a, a side passion. <laughs> we have talked about your book idea because, you know, it's a, money is like a, my, in, economics is like a side passion of mine too. Susan said, yes, personal economics should be taught in school. It's a life skill. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so we're at 12.15, but I like wonderful, exciting hour at, with you, Jamie. Um, real quick, any last urgent questions? I think we got most of them, but I do always like to give a chance. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm, I know I rambled a lot, but thank you for hearing me out today. Not at all. This is exactly the platform for that. This is an informal, just like visit with you. So yeah. So let's give Jamie a round of applause. I do like to do this at the end. Thank all right. You. Thank, thank you. you. Jamie. Thanks, yeah. Jamie. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> See you in August. Cool. <laughs>